Chapter One of Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. Chapter One Across the Atlantic. Latitude forty three degrees fifteen minutes north. Longitude fifty degrees twelve minutes west. All is intensely quiet. The revolution even of the screw has ceased. We are wrapped in a fog so dense that we feel almost unable to breathe. We shudder as we look at the white pall drawn closely around us. The decks and rigging are dripping, and everything on board is saturated with moisture. We feel strangely alone. When, hark, a discordant screech. A hideous howl belches forth into the still air to be immediately smothered and lost in the fog. It is the warning cry of the foghorn. We are on board the White Star Streamer, Germanic, in mid-Atlantic, not far off the great ice banks of Newfoundland. It was on Wednesday, the 2nd of July, that we left London, and embarked from Liverpool on the 3rd. I need not describe the previous bustle of preparation, the farewells to be gone through for a long absence of nine months, the little crowd of kind friends who came to see us off at Euston, nor our embarkation and our last view of england i remember how dull and gloomy that first evening on board closed in and how a slight feeling of depression was not absent from us the next morning we were anchoring in queenstown harbour and whilst waiting for the arrival of the mails in the afternoon we went by train to cork the mails were on board the germanic by four o'clock we weighed anchor and our voyage to america had commenced the often advertised quick passages across the Atlantic are only reckoned to and from Queenstown. The seasick traveller hardly sees the point of this computation of time, for the coasts of Old Ireland are as stormy and of as much account as the remainder of the passage. And now we have settled down into the usual idle life on board ship, a life where eating and drinking plays the most important part. There is a superfluity of concerts and literary entertainments, the proceeds in one instance being devoted to the aid of a poor electrical engineer who has had his arm fearfully torn in the machinery, and whose life was only saved by the presence of mind of a comrade in cutting the strap. Fine weather again at last, for we are past the banks so prolific in storms and fog. The story goes that a certain captain much harassed by the questioning of a passenger who asked him if it was always rough here, replied, How should I know, sir? I don't live here. We are nearing America and may hope to land tomorrow. The advent of the pilot is always an exciting event. There was a lottery for his number and much betting upon the foot with which he would first step on deck. A boat came in sight early in the afternoon. There was general excitement, but the captain refused this pilot as he had previously nearly lost one of the company's ships. At this he stood up in his dinghy and fiercely denounced us as we swept onwards little heeding. Another pilot came on board soon afterwards, but the news and papers he brought us were very stale. These pilots have a very hard life. Working in firms of two or three, they often go out five hundred miles in their cutters and lie about for days waiting to pick up vessels coming into port. The fee varies according to the draft of the ship, but often exceeds thirty pounds. At two o'clock a white line of surf is seen on the horizon. Land, we know, is behind, and great is the joy of all on board. We watched and waited till behind the white line appears a dark one, which grew and grew, until Long Island and Fire Island Lighthouse are plainly visible. Three hours more and we see the beautiful highlands of the Navasink on the New Jersey shore, and then the long sandy plain with the lighthouse which marks the entrance, and we cross the bar of Sandy Hook. As we do so, the sunset gun goes off and tells us that we must pass yet another night on board for it closes the day of the officer of health. We pass the quarantine station, a white house on a lonely rock, then entering the narrows, anchor in the dusk, off lovely Staten Island. The lights of Manhattan and New Brighton Beach twinkle in the darkness. Steamers with flashing signals ply swiftly backwards and forwards. A line of electricity marks the beautiful span of Brooklyn Bridge, and overall a storm is gathering, making the surrounding hills resound with the cannon of its thunder and the sky bright with sheets of lightning. And so we pass the night, within sight of the lights of New York, with pleasurable excitement, looking forward to our first impressions on the morrow. 
Sunday, July 13th. By six o'clock, all is life on board the Germanic, for a great steamer takes some time getting underway. Breakfast is a general scramble, interspersed with declarations of the revenue officials who are sitting in the saloon. We pass the old fort on Governor's Island, now the military station, in our upward progress, see the round tower of Castle Garden, the emigrant's depot, and by eight o'clock are safely moored alongside the company's pier. On the wharf are presently to be seen passengers sitting forlorn on their trunks, awaiting the terrible inspection of the custom house officer. The one detailed to us showed signs of becoming offensive, being unwilling to believe. Chapter Two of Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. Forty Thousand Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. New York, Hudson River, and Niagara Falls. As we drove over the rough streets of New York in the early hours of Sunday morning, it appeared as a city of the dead. There was no sign of life as our horses toiled along Broadway and up Fifth Avenue to the Buckingham Hotel, where we had secured rooms. This hotel, though comfortable, had the disadvantage of being too far uptown for short sojourners, but it has the merit of being conducted on the European system. That is, the rooms and meals are charged for separately. The American plan is to make an inclusive charge of from four to five dollars a day, and it is often troublesome only being able to have meals in the dining room between certain hours. Besides, it is pleasant to be able to visit the restaurants of New York, which are admirable and equal, if not superior, to those of Paris. Delmonico's, where we dined one evening, is particularly excellent. We were glad when eleven o'clock came and we could go to St. Thomas Church, close by. It is one of the most frequented of the many beautiful churches of all denominations in New York, and of very fine interior proportions. Upon the dark oak carving is reflected in many hues the rich stained glass. The service was rendered according to the ritual of the English church, which is followed by the Episcopal Church of America. They succeed in America in uniting a non-ceremonial service with a bright and hearty one. We listened to a very powerful sermon on St. Paul on the Hill of Mars, in which the eloquent preacher boldly declared that the political honesty of the Athenians 2,000 years ago was superior to that of the United States of today. On our way back, we went into the Roman Catholic Cathedral, which was just opposite to our windows at the Buckingham, a very large marble building, but still unfinished. We found four reporters waiting at the hotel to interview my husband. He had eluded them on the landing stage, but they would take no denial here, and we were much harassed by others in the course of the day. Our luggage arrived at noon. It is almost a necessity to employ the express company for the conveyance of baggage throughout America, as the hackney carriages and hotel omnibuses are not prepared to take it. The charges are very high, and it is often extremely inconvenient having to wait two, three, or even four hours for it after arrival in a town. The geography of New York is exceedingly simple and is followed in nearly every American city. Avenues traverse the length of the town, which are called first, second, or third avenues, and the streets which intersect them are also numbered consecutively, so that you have Third Street, Fifth Avenue, and know that it is the third street from the commencement of Fifth Avenue. The houses are built in blocks, and for the most part in the upper portion of New York, of dark red sandstone. There are ample means of cheap locomotion by two elevated railways and innumerable tramways. Each of the former runs the whole length of the city, a distance of 10 miles. They were built by rival companies who afterwards amalgamated. A double line is laid upon iron piers in the center of the street, on a level with the third stories of the houses on each side. One wonders how the necessary powers to build such a line were obtained, but in free America, vested interests and damage to property are not taken into account when financiers 
have a scheme to carry out it is said that the value of the surrounding houses has been increased rather than otherwise by the proximity of the elevated more curiously the tram lines running below it and which were formerly insolvent are now paying well the uniform fare is ten cents except after four o'clock on sundays when it is reduced to five cents the same as the fare of the trams the train consists of an engine and four light coaches all of one class and fitted with comfortable cane seats they succeed each other every five minutes a conductor is on the platform of every carriage and opens the iron gate at the end as soon as the train stops there is a marked absence of all confusion and haste partly attributable to there being no collection of tickets which are dropped into a box on the platform immediately after purchase cabs are few in number and very expensive they charge four and a half dollars or nearly one pound from the quay to the hotels without luggage and one dollar a mile or a dollar and a half per hour independently of these exorbitant prices driving is very unpleasant from the streets being paved with blocks of granite and being kept in shocking repair it is alleged that the extremes of climate prevent the use of any other material but there is probably more truth in the statement that the money voted by municipal councils for their paving finds its way into other channels washington and boston were the only towns we afterwards saw with good pavements without ruts or holes above the thoroughfares is a rows of telegraph and telephone wires and poles and standards abound in the streets at nearly every house there is a telephone to put the inmates in connection with some place of business or some relative in the afternoon we went to trinity church which may be called the cathedral of new york the service was just ending and the choir was filing out of the chancel under a blaze of golden glory from the sun shining through the east end window singing the hymn angels of jesus angels of light singing to welcome the pilgrims of the night the voices grew fainter and fainter and finally died away on the breathless stillness of the air then the huge organ blown by electricity pealed forth and the spell was broken mr vanderbilt mr astor and the stuart family live in gorgeous palaces and one is struck how even this republic cannot prevent a monopoly of property and an accumulation of wealth mr vanderbilt has three adjoining houses forming a block in fifth avenue for himself and his married children the squares and gardens are well kept and it is pleasant to see them all open full of people sitting in them without the railings which make london squares so gloomy and of so little pleasure even to those who have the entree we drove round central park a perfect triumph of landscape gardening with but little help from nature the mall and alleys were thronged with gay crowds listening to the band and boats were plying on the lake there were not many carriages the fashionable world having fled from the fagging heat of new york but those we saw had servants in livery a comparatively recent innovation and one much disapproved of by the people the crossbar wagons in general use weighing little over two hundred weight with their skeleton wheels whirl along at a great pace but the horses all have a check rein passing over the head which is far more cruel than even our gag bearing rein monday july fourteenth we began our wanderings by going over the beautiful brooklyn bridge which unites new york with its monster suburb the home of half a million of people principally of the working classes of whom a large proportion are irish it is a marvelous structure the finest suspension bridge ever built and a mile and a quarter long so graceful and light is the curve it describes that from a distance it seems to be a spider's web suspended in mid-air we had a long tram journey through the dull and dirty streets to greenwood cemetery the great burial place of new york a gateway of much beauty marks the entrance and over the center arch are the words weep not for the dead shall be raised a granite obelisk in the center of a grass plot attracts our attention below it lie the bodies of one hundred three persons who perished in the burning of the brooklyn theatre in eighteen seventy six under that green mound 
what a mass of human passions were laid to rest some of the monuments are very finely conceived in design and execution others were grotesque and ugly nothing however mars the beauty of the whole the shining river running through this valley of the dead the surroundings bright with marble flowers and shrubs only a sweet garden where the people come and walk in the evening cool watching the sun sinking over the harbor and thinking it may be of how they too will likewise join those who lie at rest here in the afternoon we paid a visit to wall street the scene of so many fortunes lost and won the din in the stock exchange was deafening and the appearance of the frantic yelling speculators anything but attractive the stores or shops in broadway are very fine inside but the windows are not so well set out as in paris or london the goods for sale are also more general in character and nearly double in price this arises from the large duties or imposts in a great measure but also because the unit of a dollar four shillings two pence is so high it seems as easy to ask one dollar as one shilling or one franc and the former coin scarcely goes farther than the latter throughout the states the new york herald times world and other papers come out with long accounts of the interviews given yesterday they went into the most precise details of dress manners and speech tuesday july fifteenth we had a pleasant morning in seeing the magnificent armory of the seventh regiment of the national guard the seventh regiment includes in its ranks some of the best men in new york and the national guard corresponds exactly to the volunteer force of england the drill hall is three hundred feet long and two hundred feet broad unbroken by a pillar and large enough to maneuver a battalion having a solid oaken floor so constructed as to prevent reverberation in marching each company has a room for itself and the officers room the library and the veterans room where those who have left the regiment come to meet their sons and relatives now serving are beautiful apartments richly furnished in the afternoon sir roderick cameron kindly took us over to his charming place on staten island it is beautifully wooded and when the salt marshes are drained and the mosquitoes reduced in numbers his farm will no doubt be the site of a populous suburb wednesday july sixteenth by nine o'clock we were waiting on the shores of the hudson river for one of the floating palaces which ply to and from albany the c vibard was seen presently coming a magnificent vessel of colossal size with three decks towering one above the other and yet drawing but six feet of water what we were particularly struck with on these river and lake steamers was that although there is no distinction of class no inconvenience whatever results all is orderly and quiet everybody is well dressed and well behaved indeed throughout the states rowdyism seems to be as absent as pauperism and the deference paid to ladies might well be imitated in older countries they have a separate entrance at hotels and a separate guichet at post offices and railway stations a lady may travel with perfect comfort alone and walk in the streets without fear of any annoyance a fresh wind dappled the blue sky and raised the muddy waters of the grand old hudson across from new jersey and hoboken those thriving suburbs of new york came the busy hum of life the well-wooded hills were clothed with villas whose domes or towers peep out from amongst the dense foliage here and there standing in a little park were chalets or a cottage with gilt minarets or even in still more incongruous taste a chinese pagoda it is here the merchants from the great city take their rest and pleasure within earshot and easy reach of their familiar haunts around wall street on the opposite shore the great wall of basaltic trap rock known to the early settlers by the name of the great chip rock but to their more practical successors as the palisades forms an impenetrable wall rising in a sheer precipice from the river a height of from three hundred to six hundred feet meandering along by its mighty brother unseen on the other side there is another river running at a lower level historical associations crowd upon us as we sail up between the broad banks 
stretching from the memory of the early band of settlers who under hendrik hudson the dutchman made the first voyage of discovery up the river to which he afterwards gave his name to the little villages of tappan and tarrytown glowing with the memories of the brave but ill-fated major andre need i repeat his well-known story in the dead of night he landed from the vulture at stony point to meet arnold who had turned traitor to arrange with him for the surrender of west point the key of the position andre was captured in returning by land searched the papers found on him and executed to the sorrow of both armies whilst arnold escaping to the vulture was rewarded with six thousand pounds and became a brigadier general in the british army many know well the monument afterwards erected to andre in westminster abbey sunnyside a little white cottage the home of washington irving lies on the hill almost hidden by the surrounding trees the front is covered with ivy grown from a sprig that sir walter scott sent from abbotsford sleepy hollow the scene of so many of washington irving's charming romances is quite near every side of life is here represented all manner of men have found their greatest happiness in the quiet beauty of the hudson's banks besides authors and actors such as forrest the great tragedian science in the person of professor morse of telegraph fame and the great merchant princes such as stuart astor and jay gould have made their homes here miss warner authoress of the wide wide world has a cottage near teller's point at tappan zee the river opens out into a lake ten miles broad the gloomy fortress of sing sing the state prison lies on an island near the shore croton lake is close by and supplies new york with from forty million to sixty million gallons daily through an aqueduct thirty-three miles long the wooden sheds found at intervals along the banks are the great storehouses where in winter the ice is cut and kept ready to supply the vast consumption of new york the beautiful bay of haverstraw leads to the narrow defile and the northern gate of the highlands in rugged and varied beauty the mountains close us in on every side overshadowing us with their wooded heights maple and sycamore mingling with darker belts of pine or a thick undergrowth of stunted oaks they are so like the highlands that you look but in vain for the bracken and the firs the glory of the hudson is at west point says a well-known author and i suppose there could not be a more beautiful situation for the military college of the united states the sandhurst of america than at west point it stands on a commanding bluff the river winding round three sides of the promontory in an almost impregnable position from the southern gate of the highlands green marshy fields with weeping willows trailing along the banks form the chief feature of the landscape and we pass several thriving towns like peekskill and poughkeepsie in the afternoon blue and purple in the far distance we saw the glorious range of the mighty catskill mountains forming one unbroken series of snow-capped domes hiding in their deep recesses many of nature's grandest secrets the evening was closing in as the steamer passed under the swinging arch of the bridge at albany the chief town of new york state albany is chiefly remarkable for its very fine capital which has been in process of building since eighteen seventy one and is still far from finished though it has already cost an enormous sum at the present time everyone is talking about albany owing to the fact that grover cleveland the newly selected democratic candidate for the presidency is the governor delaware house gave a shelter for the night and at eight a m the next morning we were in the cars on our way to niagara this was our first experience of american railways there is no distinction of classes in the railway company's fares but greater luxury is obtained by traveling in the drawing-room or sleeping car the former belonging to the wagner the latter to the pullman company who make a separate charge which is levied by the special conductor this is his only duty except to make himself a nuisance and generally objectionable the beds are made up by an obliging colored porter the cars are very long and run on sixteen wheels there is communication through the train 
but it is only used by the condescendingly grand officials and the numerous news and fruit vendors who torment you with repeated exhibitions of their varied wares the windows are so large that if open dust and grit from the slack coal burnt by the engines smother everything so that with the car full and they hold from twenty to thirty the atmosphere becomes terribly oppressive in winter and when the stoves are lighted it is even worse the americans are very proud of their railway system but after travelling over most of their lines it is impossible to see that we have much to learn from them the traffic is conducted in a very happy-go-lucky style there is an absence of civility with a superabundance of officials and a porter is not to be met with the traveller must carry his hand luggage himself the system of checking the baggage is however admirable a brass check attached to the trunk ensures its going safely to any destination however distant and only being given up on presentation of the duplicate which is in possession of the passenger our journey lay through the smiling valley of the mohawk river the operation of haymaking was going on in many of the fields we passed the hay was cut raked turned over unloaded and stacked by machinery the most convincing proof of the absence of hand labor throughout the vast continent of america from the farms of the east to the cattle ranches of the west there is the same cry for labor still greater is the demand for domestic servants american girls think nothing of serving in a store or at a railway buffet or even in a hotel they have their freedom at certain hours and when their work is done they are their own mistresses but domestic service they look upon as degrading it is almost wholly confined to irish immigrants a gentleman told us of a large mountain hotel where the waiting during the summer months of the season was done by an entire school of young ladies who at the end of the time returned with their salaries the term of wages is never used to pay for their winter schooling at syracuse we experienced for the first time the strange custom of running the train through a street in the heart of the city many lives are annually lost and terrible accidents occur frequently at the level crossings look out for the locomotive is on a large signboard but the public depend more upon the shrill whistle or the ringing of the engine bell the effect of these engine bells is very melodious when deep-toned and loud-voiced coming and going in a station they chime to each other friday july eighteenth clifton house niagara falls what a moment in a lifetime is that in which we first behold niagara and it is difficult with a very feeble pen to say anything superior to such a commonplace platitude even when in the presence of one of nature's most glorious works notwithstanding all written and said imagined or described niagara cannot be put into words cannot be conveyed to the imagination through the usual medium of pen and paper can only be seen to be even then but partially understood there is a blue river two miles wide without ripple or ruffle on the surface coming down from a great lake pursuing its even course there are breakers ahead little clouds then white foam sprayed into mid-air the contagion spreads until on the whole surface of the river are troubled waves noisily hurrying down down with ever-increasing velocity to the great canadian fall the mockery of those few yards of clear still water in a suction green as an uncut emerald a volume of water twenty fathoms deep is hurled over a precipice one hundred sixty feet high one hundred million tons of water pass over every hour with a roar that can be heard ten miles away and a reverberation that shakes the very earth itself into the seething cauldron below shrouded in an eternal mist there is neither speech nor language but their voices are heard in a minor key the american waters repeat the mighty cannonade and blending their voices mirror the sea-green color of the wooded precipices as they flow on their onward course long serpent trails of foam alone bear witness to the late convulsion the gorge is narrowing the waters are compressed into a smaller space they are angry and jostle each other they hiss they swirl they separate to rush together in shooting shower of spray and so struggle through the rapids 
a gloomy pool with darkling precipices of purple rocks forms a basin the waters are rushing too surely into that iron-bound pool the current is checked and turned back on itself to meet the oncoming stream a mighty whirlpool forms the waters divide under the current and one volume returns to eddy and swirl helplessly against the great barrier whilst the other volume more happy finds a cleft broaden now into a wide gateway and gurgling and laughing to itself glides away on a smooth course to lose its volume in lake ontario what a world renown that stream will always have a short course full of awful incident on the twenty fifth of july eighteen eighty three captain webb was drowned while attempting to swim the rapids diving from a small boat about three hundred yards above the new cantilever bridge he plunged into the stream the force of the current turned him over several times then he threw up his arms and sank crushed to death it is supposed by the pressure of the water the enterprising owners of the restaurant at the rapids have arranged with his widow to come over during the season to sell photographs opposite the spot where her husband perished goat island forms the division between the american and canadian falls the waters are rapidly eating away the banks and the rocky promontory which forms such a principal feature may some day disappear what a glorious junction it would be four years ago a large piece of rock in the centre of the horseshoe came away and its symmetry was somewhat marred the three pretty little sister islands are joined by their graceful suspension bridges to goat island these islands lying out as they do amidst the roughest and most tumultuous part of the rapids have a magnificent view of the waters as they come tumbling down the hermit's cascade is connected with the pathetic story of a young englishman who coming one day to see niagara remained day after day overpoweringly fascinated unable to tear himself away he lived year after year forever within sight and hearing of the falls he is supposed to have perished in their waters whilst bathing one day but whether intentionally or not was never known i believe those who have sat and watched those tumultuous waters for any great length of time would understand the working of the spell on a sensitive brain biddle stairs lead down to the cave of the winds it is awe-inspiring to watch the fall from below and yet this is only a streamlet of the great volume of the fall what must it be inside when the beating of the spray like hail the roaring of the winds mingling with the thunder of the cataract form a combination of the majesty of the elements on earth after a morning spent amongst these terrifying wonders we had a quiet drive along the right bank of the river through cedar island the thunder and roar was succeeded by quiet pools and swiftly flowing currents calm and clear rippling in the afternoon sunlight weeping willows long grasses and bending reeds whispered in the cool breezes from the heights above we again surveyed the whole scene and returning home once more came under the spell of the mermaid looming white and mysterious in the gloaming niagara becomes very dear a child of the affections and to those who are unfortunate enough to have to picture niagara from description i should say efface mine quickly quickly i say and turn to that of anthony trollope of all the sights on this earth of ours which tourists travel to see at least of all those which i have seen i am inclined to give the palm to the falls of niagara in the catalogue of such sites i intend to include all buildings pictures statues and wonders of art made by men's hands and also all beauties of nature prepared by the creator for the delight of his creatures i know no other one thing so beautiful so glorious and so powerful we will go at once on to the glory and the thunder and the majesty and the wrath of that upper belt of waters go down to the end of that wooden bridge seat yourself on the rail and there sit till all the outer world is lost to you there is no grander spot around niagara than this the waters are absolutely around you if you have that power of eye control which is so necessary to the full enjoyment of scenery you will see nothing but the water you will certainly hear nothing else and the sound i beg you to remember 
is not an ear-cracking agonized crash and clang of noises but is melodious and soft withal though loud as thunder it fills your ears and as it were envelops them but at the same time you can speak to your neighbor without an effort but at these places and in these moments the less of speaking i should say the better there is no grander spot than this here seated on the rail of the bridge you will not see the whole depth of the fall in looking at the grandest works of nature and of art too i fancy it is never well to see all there should be something left to the imagination and much should be half concealed in mystery and so here at niagara that converging rush of waters may fall down down at once into a hell of rivers for what the eye can see it is glorious to watch them in their first curve over the rocks they come green as a bank of emeralds but with a fitful flying color as though conscious that in one moment more they would be dashed into spray and rise into the air pale as driven snow the vapor rises high into the air and is gathered there visible always as a permanent white cloud over the cataract but the bulk of the spray which fills the lower hollow of that horseshoe is like a tumult of snow the head of it rises ever and anon out of that cauldron below but the cauldron itself will be invisible it is ever so far down far as your own imagination can sink it but your eyes will rest full upon the curve of the waters the shape you will be looking at is that of a horseshoe but of a horseshoe miraculously deep from toe to heel and this depth becomes greater as you sit there that which at first was only great and beautiful becomes gigantic and sublime till the mind is at a loss to find an epithet for its own use to realize niagara you must sit there till you see nothing else than that which you have come to see you will hear nothing else and think of nothing else at length you will be at one with the tumbling river before you you will find yourself among the waters as though you belong to them the cool liquid green will run through your veins and the voice of the cataract will be the expression of your own heart you will fall as the bright waters fall rushing down into your new world with no hesitation and with no dismay and you will rise again as the spray rises bright beautiful and pure then you will flow away in your course to the uncompassed distant and eternal ocean o oh, my friend let there be no one there to speak to thee then no not even a brother as you stand there speak only to the waters end of section two chapter number three of forty thousand miles over land and water this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox.org forty thousand miles over land and water by ethel gwendolyn vincent chapter three the dominion of canada since our arrival at Niagara, we had been on Canadian soil, and in view of the falls which form Canada's greatest glory. But our first experience of the Dominion only really commenced when we left Niagara Station by the Grand Trunk Railway for Toronto. It may have been prejudice, but we thought that the country bore signs of greater prosperity than over the American border. The farms are more English in character, and the cattle in greater abundance. The soil looks richer, and the pretty wooden zigzag fences, which take the place of hedges or railings, look most picturesque. In many places, the blackened stumps of trees showed the recent clearing by fire. From Hamilton, a prosperous town, we ran for nearly 40 miles along the shores of Lake Ontario to Toronto. Toronto was the capital of the province of Ontario, the chief city of Upper Canada, and the Queen City of the West. There is jealous rivalry between Montreal and Toronto. The former has the shipping interest and for a long time held the lead. But Toronto is quickly gaining ground and is the center for a rapidly increasing commercial interest. Five lines of railway converge to her termini. Hamilton and London, both rising places, centralize their commerce here. Lake Ontario supplies water transit to Montreal and the ocean and the numerous banks do a thriving trade. 
In 1871, the census of the population was 50,600. Ten years later, it was 80,445. Wide streets of great length, avenues of trees, and churches are the chief characteristics of Toronto. The churches are built from the voluntary subscriptions of the congregations, the pastors being chosen and maintained by them. There is no state church, and the dissenters have as fine places of worship as the Episcopal body. The Metropolitan Methodist Church, with almost cathedral proportions, was built by Mr. Punchin, the American Spurgeon, and it compares as advantageously to the tabernacle as do the churches to the chapels of England. Toronto abounds in pretty suburbs, chief among them being Rosedale. The comfortable wooden houses of the upper and middle orders convey an idea of prosperity with their neat gardens, a swinging hammock in the creeper-covered veranda, and the family sitting out in the cool of the evening. The provincial parliament is a dingy building, but Osgood Hall, or the law courts, opened in 1860 by the Prince of Wales and called after the Chief Justice of that day, is a very fine stone edifice, complete in all its arrangements. There are full-length portraits of the Chief Justices in succession, which being continued will form a very complete legal gallery of local talent. There are 14 judges receiving $5,000 a year, nominated by the Governor General from local men. The bar and solicitors are united as in America and work together in firms and are both eligible for judicial preferment and have a like right of audience. The Toronto University is second only to Harvard on the American continent. The lecture rooms, hall, museum, and library are all worthy of the fine Gothic building. There are 600 students, many of whose families coming to reside in Toronto add much to the pleasantness of society. We stayed three days at Toronto. Mr. Hodgins, QC, Master in Chancery, was most kind in introducing my husband to some of the chief political men. To Mr. Mackenzie, the late Liberal Premier. Mr. Blake, the present leader of the opposition. Mr. Ross, the Minister of Public Education, and others. The latter minister showed us over the normal school for the instruction of teachers. It has a well-arranged library and museum and copies of many works of the old masters and busts of the principal men in British history. Toronto is considered the most English of all the Canadian towns, and the Torontons pride themselves on this and take a keen interest in home affairs. The previous night's debate in Parliament is on the breakfast table, cabled over and aided by five hours difference between the time of Greenwich and that of the Dominion, it appears in the first edition. We dined with Mr. Goldwyn Smith, the distinguished Oxford professor of history, who, after a long sojourn in the United States and Canada, has settled with his wife at Toronto. Their house is delightfully old-fashioned. Though in the center of the town, the garden and some of the original forest trees are still preserved to it, and it contains the tail end of family collections, valuable bits of china, busts by Canova and Thorwaldsden, ivory carvings, morsels of jade, and some relics of the first settlers. Amongst the latter are some wine glasses belonging to General Simcoe, the first governor general in 1794, which are without feet, to be returned when empty. Wednesday, July 23rd. We left Toronto in the afternoon by the steamer Algeria, coasting along the low-lying country of the left bank of Lake Ontario. Touching at the various thriving towns, we judged by the crowd who came down to the pier that it was the usual thing for the population to stroll down in the evening and watch for the arrival of the steamer. All night we were crossing Lake Ontario, and at four o'clock the next morning, in the grey dawn, touched at Kingston. We waited there an hour for daylight, in which to approach the Thousand Islands. As we passed out, we saw the gilt dome of the famous military college. In the freshness of the early morning, with the sun just flushing the waters and warming life into the bare and purple rocks, we wound in and out of the narrow channel of the Thousand Islands. It is the largest collective number of islands in the world. Some are formed of a few bare rocks just appearing on the surface of the water. Others are large enough for a villa 
a garden, and a boathouse, and others again for farming purposes. Their uniform flatness causes some disappointment and mars their collective beauty, though here and there one may be singled out for the prettiness of its woods. At Alexandra Bay, a familiar summer resort with two monster hotels, the St. Lawrence opens away from the lake and we are descending between its monotonous banks for some hours. The increasing swiftness of the current and the prevailing thrill of excitement of all on board warns us of the approach of the Long Sioux Rapids. We see a stormy sea and surging in huge billows. All steam is shut off. Four men are required at the wheel to keep the vessel steady as we shoot the rapid. One minute we are engulfed, the next rising on the crest of the wave. Intense and breathless excitement is combined with the exhilaration of being carried in a few minutes down the nine miles of descent. Every now and again a peculiar motion is felt as if the ship was settling down as she glides from one ledge of rock to another. We pass some smaller rapids, but it is late in the afternoon before Baptiste, the Indian pilot, comes on board for the shooting of the great Lachine Rapid. Whirlpools and a storm-lashed sea mingle in this reach, for the shoal water is hurled out among the rocks. The greatest care and precision of skill are necessary, for with lightning speed we rush between two rocks, jagged and cruel, lying in wait for the broaching of the vessel. The steamer wrecked last year lies stranded away on the rocks as a warning. These natural barriers to the water communication between Montreal and the west are overcome by canals running parallel with the rapids. The Ottawa forms a junction with the St. Lawrence at the pretty village of St. Anne's, which has become famed by Moore's well-known Canadian boat song. Row, brothers, row, the steam runs fast, the rapids are near and the daylight's past. Soon as the woods on shore grow dim, we'll sing at St. Anne's our evening hymn. The Victoria Bridge, a triumph of engineering skill, spans the river above Montreal. It is built of solid rocks of granite, a mile and three quarters in length, and it is in passing under its noble arches that we get our first view of Montreal, the metropolis of the Dominion. A filmy mist lay over the city of Spires, spreading up even to the sides of Mount Royal, the wooded mountain that rises abruptly and stands solitary guard behind the city. The golden dome of the old market of Bon Secours and the twin spires of the Cathedral of Notre Dame loomed faintly out from its midst. Before us there is a sea frontage of three miles, vessels of 5,000 tons being able to anchor beside the quay. 150 years ago, the French evacuated Montreal, but you might think it was but yesterday, so tenaciously do the lower orders cling to the tradition of their founder, Jacques Cartier. The quaint gabled houses and crooked streets of the lower town, the clattering and gesticulating of the white-capped women marketing in Bon Secours, remind one of a typical Normandy town. Notices are posted in French and English, and municipal and local affairs are conducted in both languages. The post office, the bank, and the assurance company make a fine block of buildings as the nucleus of the principal street of Notre Dame, but all the others are crooked, narrow, and ill-paved. The Catholic cathedral in the quiet square is very remarkable for its double tier of galleries and for being painted and decorated gaudily from floor to roof. The Young Men's Christian Association has erected a number of its fine buildings at Montreal. The society seems to thrive and be doing an enormous work of good through the length and breadth of the American continent. We found it well housed in every conceivable town we visited, and what was our surprise when later we found it had penetrated even to the Sandwich Islands and that the YMCA was one of Honolulu's finest buildings. Sunday, July 26th. We went to morning service at the English Cathedral of Christ Church. The interior is bare and unfinished at present, but it is the best specimen of English Gothic architecture on the Western continent. There was a good mixed choir of men and women. We had a charming drive in the afternoon up Mount Royal from which the city takes its name. Fine houses and villas standing in their own gardens lie around the base, and the ascent through luxuriant groves of sycamore trees is so well engineered as to be almost imperceptible. You do not realize how high you are till the glorious panorama opens out before you and you stand on a platform. Montreal at your feet, 
the broad river flowing to right and left, and the blue mountains on the horizon line. We returned by the cemetery, a square mile, laid out in avenues and shady walks. Flowers blossoming on the graves and smooth-shaven turf made it a garden and favorite drive and walk. At the entrance was a notice, a sarcasm on human nature, desiring persons wishing to return from funerals by the mountain drive to remove their mourning badges. That evening we dined with Mr. and Mrs. George Stephen in their beautiful house in Drummond Street. He is the president of the Canadian Pacific Railway. In two years' time, this railway will run from ocean to ocean and will join the Atlantic and Pacific, opening up the unlimited lands of the great Northwest, so rich in mineral wealth and containing the best wheat-growing country in the world. This discovery of the Northwest has altered the whole aspect of affairs in Canada, and by bringing into habitation a country as large as the United States laid the foundation of an immense future for our great possession. 36,000 men are now working on the railway, and it will be completed in half the time of the contract, viz. five years instead of ten. Monday, July 27th. Three hours by rail, through a thinly populated district and backwoods roughly cleared by burning, brought us to a gloriously golden sunset against which rose the spires of the Dominion Houses of Parliament at Ottawa. Ottawa was only a small town with about 4,000 inhabitants in 1867. All ask, why was it chosen as the seat of government, which previously had been at Quebec, Montreal, and Toronto alternately? A minister's wife traveling with us in the train laughingly gave us the answer, Quebec refused to vote for Montreal, Montreal for Quebec, and between them there was always warring jealousy. Toronto would have voted for Montreal if Quebec had been willing to do the same. The authorities at home, it is said the Queen herself, taking the map, pointed to Ottawa as being equidistant from all and on the borders of both Upper and Lower Canada. A magnificent pile of buildings accordingly rose, containing two legislative halls for the Senate and the House of Commons, both the same size as their English originals, and other public offices. The Parliament buildings are built off buff freestone with many towers and miniature spires and have a very fine frontage of 1,200 feet surmounted by the iron crown of the Victoria Tower. The octagonal tower contains a library of 40,000 books open not only to members but to all the inhabitants of the town. In the center stands a full-length marble statue of the Queen by Marshall Wood. The members speak in French or English at will, and all notices of motions are in both languages. Timber lugging is the great trade of Ottawa. As seen from the upper town, the lower presents the appearance of one vast timber yard. Masses of piles line the banks and cover the surface of the stream. These piles are cut in the winter from the back forests and floated down some 100 miles. At Ottawa, they pass into the yards through what is called a timber slide to avoid the dangerous channel of the Chaudière Falls. Here they are lashed together to form rafts, houses being built for the men who drift down on them to Quebec. From thence they are shipped to all parts of the world, principally to England. We went over one of these large timber mills and Eddie's match manufactory, both immensely interesting, with the perfection of machinery entirely superseding any manual dexterity, and driven by the neighboring water power. The La Chaudière Falls, so called from the cauldron into which they seethe and boil, though not of a great height, have been sounded to 300 feet without touching the bottom. They contain a very angry, copper-colored element. We drove out to Rideau Hall, the residence of the Governor-General, who was away at the time. We found a very deserted, miserable building, about which the only sign of life was a sleepy policeman. A tobogging slide seemed to usurp the greater part of the garden. The Ottawa public was much offended by a recent prohibition forbidding entrance to the park, which has hitherto been free to all. There is a little occurrence which will always remain connected in our minds with Ottawa, an example which we certainly found followed nowhere else. Our driver, even after considerable pressure, refused to take more than his ordinary fare. Ottawa, other than the Parliament buildings, which are alone worth coming to see, 
is the dullest and most primitive of towns. C was, however, glad to have been there as it gave him the opportunity of meeting the ministers of inland revenue and agriculture and other authorities and hearing their views on rapid development of Canada. Returning to Montreal, we took the night boat to Quebec. A golden, glorious sunset, sinking behind purple clouds, was reflected in the water, and this was succeeded by a trail of silver light from the newly risen crescent moon. Tuesday, July 29th. At 7 a.m. on a cloudy morning, from the deck of the steamer we were looking up at Quebec, perched Gibraltar-like on an inaccessible promontory of precipitous rock formed by the junction of the River St. Charles with the St. Lawrence. The narrow streets of the lower town, with their picturesque red-tiled roofs and overhanging gables, seem at first sight as if they were entirely cut off from the upper town by a shelving mass of rocks. However, we were soon wending our way upwards by a street so steep that it could only be likened to climbing a mountain. The houses on either side seemed also to be climbing the roof of the houses above, the upper story being on a level with the second floor of its neighbor. Any sand there ever has been was long washed down by the rain, leaving a stony surface as a precarious foothold for the poor struggling horses. This was the more circuitous route for carriages. A nearer one for pedestrians lay in the perpendicular flight of steps cut out in the face of the rocks leading immediately to Dufferin Terrace. This terrace was called after Lord Dufferin, the most popular of governors-general, and is built on the old buttresses and platform formerly occupied by the Chateau of St. Louis. It is a favorite resort of the townspeople, perhaps as being the only level ground, so far as we could see in the town, but probably more so on account of the beautiful view it commands over the river. Vessels of all classes and sizes, coming from all parts of the world, but more specifically from England, were anchoring in the broad basin formed by the confluence of the two rivers. Immediately beneath us were the wharves of the old town, where we could see two or three colliers discharging coal, and even here in the still morning air the rattling of the chains as the crane was swung to and fro. On the opposite side rose the fortified bluff of Point Levy, and on the other the St. Charles winding away up its peaceful valley. The white houses of Beaufort form a straggling line almost as far as the Montmorency Falls, which latter seem only a speck in the distance. There was a light morning mist floating away over the opposite heights, and the murmur of the busy hum of life reached us from below. The governor's garden, facing the road on the opposite side, is only an enclosure overgrown with rank weeds and grass, but it contains the obelisk erected to the joint memory of Wolfe and Montcalm. It is a novel idea to combine the names of the victorious and conquered, but it shows a true appreciation of the two generals who each gave up their life for their country in the hour of battle. In the Ursuline convent nearby, we see Montcalm's grave, said to have been made by the bursting of one of the enemy's shells during the bombardment, with the inscription in French, Honor to Montcalm, fate, in depriving him of victory, rewarded him by a glorious death. There are some very quaint old buildings and curious bits of architecture in out-of-the-way corners, and the town altogether has an old-world look, as if life were passing it by. The outside of the Catholic cathedral is homely and irregular, and very damp and musty inside, but attached to one of the pillars is a fine, crucifixion by Van Dyck, and the adjoining seminary has quite a large collection of pictures highly prized by the inhabitants, though by artists unknown to fame. The Laval University, chartered by the Queen in 1852, is the most modern building in Quebec. The population is almost entirely French, and the maintenance of their language and institutions was guaranteed to them at the conquest. Descendants of the old noblesse still linger here, preserving among themselves the tradition of their forefathers in a circle of society renowned for its polish and refinement, preserving, too, in its entirety, the purity of the mother language. They do not mix at all with the English. The citadel is gloriously situated on the high ground above the town, surrounded by walls and ramparts, but our approach to it was under the following untoward circumstances. 
We hired an ungainly cabriolet, a vehicle on two wheels, with a narrow board in front, on which the driver, a raw-boned Irish boy in our case, driving a sorry steed, was seated. After going up a very steep hill, the entrance to the fortress is over a wooden drawbridge guarded by massive chain gates. The hollow sound of the wood frightened the horse beyond control, and we discovered then that he could go, when he turned and bolted down the hill. We only prevented ourselves from being pitched out head foremost by clinging on to the sides of the old-fashioned hood. The driver was powerless, and C eventually stooped over and jerked the reins happily with success. We must have caused much amusement to the soldiers looking out from the guardhouse window. The Governor General's residence is part of the low stone building in the courtyard, the remainder of the citadel being used for barracks. The windows on the riverside command a superb view. In the absence of Lord Lansdowne, Lord and Lady Melgund entertained us most hospitably and very kindly took us on the river in the police launch after luncheon, near enough to obtain a good view of the beautiful Montmorency Falls. The volume of water is powerful in the first instance, but dwindles into fringes and evaporates altogether in mist at the base. A storm was gathering on the heights as we returned, and a dense bank of fog rolled down the river. The thunder muttered overhead, and a rift in the clouds let a curious light stream over the roofs of the town. And then, closing up, the black clouds swept towards us, creeping up Diamond Cape, till the citadel above loomed out white and ghostly from the surrounding clearness. In a downpour of tropical rain, we reached the wharf. We should like to have managed an expedition from Quebec to the beautiful Saguenay River, combining a visit to Sir John MacDonald, the present premier, but that great nemesis, time, was already beginning to pursue us. We left Quebec the next morning, passing again through Montreal at five in the afternoon, and sleeping at Plattsburgh on the shores of Lake Champlain. It was a great disappointment to us not to be able to see more of Canada, but we shall hope to pay it a more extended visit on some future occasion. It offers as great attractions to the lover of nature as to the sportsman, and affords a glorious and unlimited field for the emigration of men and women since the opening up of the Far West by the Canadian Pacific Railway. End of Chapter 3 Read by Sharantha Bedigay, Toronto, Canada, August 2021Chapter 4, Part 1 of 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Read by Betty B. 40,000 Miles Over Land and Water by Ethel Gwendolyn Vincent. The American Lakes and the Centers of Learning, Fashion, and Government. Thursday, July 31st. Up at 6 a.m. this morning to catch the steamer. However early we rise for these matutinal starts, there is always a rush in the end to catch the train or boat. It is a depressing thought when we think of what frequent occurrence they will be for the next few months. We were soon plying our way over the placid bosom of Lake Champlain, holding a central course. The shores on either side are flat and ugly, for the beauty of the lake lies in the broad expanse of unruffled waters reflecting the various changes of the sky generally of a heavenly blue but on this morning taking the leaden hue of the low-lying clouds numberless islands lay dotted on the calm surface kept fresh and green from the continued lapping of the waters around their indented shores the range of the green mountains of vermont lay hidden by a transparent haze the sun shining brightly behind and presently piercing through rising to gladden the gloomy morning after crossing the broad bay and touching at a further point in the eastern shore at burlington a thriving town the waters narrowed and flowed on the one side through flat green meadows pretty though uninteresting but on the other rose in the full beauty of their verdant summer foliage the mountains of the adirondacks the steamer threaded its way through the narrow channels and we lay right under their mighty shadows, looking into the calm depths of the quiet pools 
formed by the boulders of rock that in the course of ages have loosened their hold and slipped down the precipitous sides we looked up into dark ravines piercing through the heart of the mountains dividing one rounded peak from another we followed the undulating outline of the mountains now bare and stony or more often fringed to the summit with pine forests the dark green of these pines and the bright foliage of the stunted oaks formed a brilliant contrast to the orange lichen covering the gray protruding boulders here and there we came upon a wall of rocks descending in a sheer precipice to the lake reflecting purple shadows on the still water and so we passed on one scene of beauty succeeding another till we reached fort ticonderoga it was here during the revolutionary war that the brave ethan allen with his celebrated band of green mountain boys surprised the british commander in the dead of night and appearing at his bedside demanded the immediate surrender of the fort in whose name demanded de la place in the name of the great jehovah and the continental congress replied allen and the fort was surrendered an hour by rail brought us to the head of lake george the indians gave it the poetical name of horicon or silvery waters from the great purity of the water its peaceful shores have been the scene of many a bloody battle in the great conflict between the indian and the white man and the mountains have oft resounded to the war whoop and battle cry of the savages and the despairing shriek of the captives whom they scalped alive now a death-like stillness broods over the scene the scenery of lake george is far grander than that of champlain the other only leads up to and forms a preparation for this one the mountains which surround lake george and close it in on all sides have a bolder more sweeping outline here and there one projects lone and solitary forming a promontory round which the steamer creeps seeming to cling to its densely wooded sides the dark whispering pine forests grow down to the very edge of the waters mingling their sighings with the rustling of the waters over a shallow bottom there are numberless islands some mere strips of sandy beach and rocks dividing the silvery rapids on either side and others are wooded with a stunted undergrowth we noticed one curious conical shaped mountain formed of a sharp escarpment of rock from the summit to the base which is called rogers slide the story goes that an englishman major rogers being hotly pursued by the indians to the edge of the cliffs suddenly bethought himself of reversing his snowshoes and retracing his steps by this means leaving no footprints the indians tracked him to the brink of the precipice and then concluded he had slid down into the lake under the protection of the great spirit as the steamer turned into the narrows we saw a beautiful little waterfall falling down the ravine in a feathery shower of spray spanned in the afternoon light by a vivid rainbow at sabbath day point the scenery is more striking and majestic think of the trosachs in the highlands and that will give the best idea of the grandeur of the scene before us adding to the beauty of all we saw that afternoon was the ceaseless play of light and shadow on the mountains i tried to carry away with me in the mind's eye the picture of those mountains dark and powerful as a background the quiet beauty and the picturesqueness along the banks as a foreground and the deep calm blue waters of the lake all around alas a sudden storm came up and obscured the view before us and we ended our journey at fort william in a blinding hurricane of rain and wind we were glad to find shelter from it in the train which brought us to saratoga springs by the evening friday august first saratoga is the ems or baden baden of america the most fashionable resort as a watering place only equaled by the more select charms of newport seen on a sunny morning such as we had nothing can surpass the brightness and gaiety of the scene in broadway along its broad shady avenues stroll the collected beauty and fashion gathered at saratoga and light cross-bar wagons and buggies bowl swiftly by there are no villas but life is confined entirely to pensions and the three colossal hotels in broadway 
the united states is perhaps the finest of them it covers seven acres of ground accommodates twelve hundred guests and gives employment to one hundred fifty black waiters built round three sides of a quadrangle there are broad covered piazzas running the entire length of the building opening on to a large and beautifully kept garden gay with flowers morning and evening the band plays here when the piazza becomes a fashionable promenade visitors from all the other hotels congregating in it american women are the best dressers in the world for taste and skillful combination particularly in pale colors they are unsurpassed a change of costume thrice daily is absolutely de rigueur at saratoga and it becomes at last quite exciting to see how many more varied dresses are going to appear illustrating a great feature in american life is the wing devoted to the cottages where families come and live during the season in separate suites everything being provided by the hotel a good example of the attendance which is expected you will require can be gathered from the notice in each room ring once for the bellman twice for stationery and three times for ice water the chambermaid plays a very unimportant part in any hotel and a bellman is attached to each floor the consumption of iced water is prodigious not only is it placed at your elbow at every meal but large jugs of it are brought at stated hours of the day to every room at the united states it was quite formidable walking the immense length of the dining room or venturing across the vast spaces of the yellow satin lined drawing room the lift has been known to go up and down three hundred times in the course of the afternoon amid the shady groves and green lawns of congress park we found the mineral springs bubbling up into artificial wells with a few drinkers idling about and languidly sipping their waters but we came to the conclusion that visitors were not here so much for the purposes of health as of amusement the springs are of all kinds vichy sulphur iron magnesia soda etc and it has often been necessary to bore down several hundred feet before finding the water two or three of the most powerful medicinal springs are some miles away and these are bottled and brought in fresh daily for the drinkers in town the fashionable afternoon drive is to the lake some two miles away and is reached by a straight dusty road bordered for the most part by rushes and long grass where the frogs maintain a cheerful chorus of chirping when you arrive there you find a primitive cafe with groups sitting about the tables under the trees and the lake pretty enough lying in the hollow with small excursion steamers constantly plying from the landing in the evening there is generally a hop or dance advertised in one or other of the hotels but i confess that that evening we preferred the good-humored crowd and the fireworks in congress park to the hop at congress hall hotel alternating with the fireworks were the strains of the band wafted from the pagoda in the center of the lake and all sat about heedless of the heavy dew lying on the grass we were very sorry to leave saratoga the next morning and undergo a very hot and dusty journey to boston we passed pittsburgh as famed for its great ladies college as its southern namesake is for its ironworks and late in the afternoon reached boston massachusetts a red and yellow coach suspended by straps to sea springs such as were used in the last century conveyed us to the hotel vendome i think boston the most charming of all the american towns the broad sweeping avenues are bordered by houses of red sandstone a soft mellow color that contrasts well with the green avenues of trees and grass borders commonwealth avenue is the finest of these continuous parks and is a mile and a half long the common with its avenues of fine elm trees forms a large open space in the middle of the town and separated only by a road are the public gardens a bronze statue of washington rises in the middle surrounded by a brilliant flower bed the colors blending in carpet gardening to form a moorish inscription which translated means god is all-powerful a very fitting motto for the great hero the gilded dome of the massachusetts state house 
dominates them from the eminence of beacon hill but far more interesting than this new erection is the venerable time-worn building of the old state house where some of the most stirring scenes of the revolution were enacted from this balcony the declaration of independence was read to the people our troops occupied the buildings during the stamp riots but at the close of the war washington stood on its steps the chosen hero of the exultant populace so many of the buildings are closely associated with humiliating remembrances of that fatal epoch in british history when these fair provinces owing to the lack of foresight and imbecility of her leaders were forever lost to england there is the old scotch church so famous as the political meeting place of the boston tea party tancred hall the cradle of liberty nurtured by the patriotic orations of adams everett and above all of daniel webster the harbor with its numerous shipping where was lighted the first straw of that great conflagration of the rebellion by the throwing overboard of those few chests of tea the city is rich in churches there being no less than one hundred fifty belonging to all denominations who raise their spires heavenwards within its precincts but trinity church surpasses all in beauty and design it is built of granite and freestone in the form of a latin cross in romanesque style the stained glass is rich in harmonious coloring depicting no subject but blending into a mystery of blue orange and purple some lancet windows filled with iridescent glass of pale blue gave the appearance of shining steel we started early on that quiet sunday morning for a drive to cambridge in one of the herdic hansoms these curious vehicles with their jolting motion can only be described as a covered two-wheel cart we pass the green hill on which stands bunker's hill monument it is inexpressibly grand in its massive simplicity being only huge blocks of granite narrowing in such imperceptible proportion to the summit that the pyramidal ending seems in perfect accord with the broad base no railing surrounds it there is no decoration or inscription it stands alone in its majesty sufficiently raised to be a landmark to the whole town our road led through charlestown where the seafaring population chiefly live close to the harbor a long straight dusty road under a blazing sun for three miles brought us to cambridge the immediate approach to which is through stately avenues of elm trees the colleges of harvard university are clustered together forming an irregular quadrangle there was a delightfully quiet and studious look about the dull red brick buildings low latticed windows and ivy-covered walls a look of antiquity unusual to america in this comparatively newly risen continent so much is thought of age that harvard college the oldest of the fifteen of which the university consists is prized most highly for its foundation dating from sixteen thirty six chief amongst the colleges for beauty is the gothic tower of memorial hall erected by the alumni in memory of the students who perished in the war of secession it contains the great dining hall with carved screens and galleries busts and portraits of the founders of the college and has stained glass windows bearing the college and state arms a theater library museum scientific school and chapel are in different parts of the irregularly laid out square which is sacred to the university buildings it was vacation time and the place was utterly deserted save by a few straggling churchgoers their footsteps resounding on the narrow paved walk and lingering amongst the tenantless walls it must be a different scene in term when thirteen hundred students and forty-seven professors gather under the classic shades of a university already numbering among its former students such men as john adams the second president of the united states edward everett ralph waldo emerson oliver wendell holmes john lathrop motley j russell lowell and wendell phillips the university course extends over four years it may be interesting to know in face of the recent agitation at our own universities on the subject that women are not as yet admitted to the university lectures though allowed to matriculate 
and pass the different examinations. Quite near the university is a battered elm tree whose shattered branches are sustained by iron stanchions and which marks the place where General Washington took command of the rebellious colonists. Further on, we passed a plain square wooden house with pointed roof and a small garden surrounded by a high laurel hedge, a gravel path, and little white gate leading to the veranda and entrance. There was nothing particular to mark a house homely enough in its exterior, but yet it was here that in 1775 Washington established his headquarters when it was the scene of many warlike preparations and much enthusiasm. Later, it has been hallowed by the quiet presence of the great poet Longfellow. The old house by the Lindens stood silent in the shade, and on the graveled pathway the light and shadow played. And it was in this quiet retreat that he passed away in 1882. We followed the winding road, almost an avenue of willow trees, to Mount Auburn Cemetery, and with great difficulty found his last resting place. We were terribly disillusioned. Not a garden of flowers tended by loving hands, not a simple marble monument with short inscription, prompted by a knowledge of the gentle, retiring nature. But we found a great, ugly block of sandstone, a huge sarcophagus with a name and date on one side and an ingenious pattern on the other, taking X as a center letter and forming a senseless device and utterly inappropriate to the memory of the great poet. No more beautiful garden than this cemetery could be conceived, grassy slopes planted with waving palms and the choicest plants, bright flower beds interspersed among the white marble crosses and memorials of the dead, an air of quiet beauty and repose, mingling with the many signs of respectful care on the different graves, such as bunches of newly cut flowers. Those who have served their country had a miniature flag of the stars and stripes waving over their heads. The mortuary chapel stands on the high ground, and opposite to it there is a magnificent marble sphinx with this soul-stirring inscription, American Union Preserved, African Slavery Destroyed, by the uprising of a great people, by the blood of fallen heroes. Throughout the length and breadth of America, this intense respect to the dead may be seen in regard to their last resting place. In strange contrast is the irreverence shown in the removal of bodies. Several times we saw coffins traveling at first-class fares, placed in the luggage vans, piled under Saratoga trunks, and with the party of mourners in the same train. In returning from the cemetery, we passed Mr. Russell Lowell's country house, standing in grounds fairly hidden by surrounding trees. Boston is the great literary and scientific center of America. The saying goes that at Boston they ask you what you know, in New York what you have, and at Philadelphia who you are. Fostered by its close neighborhood to Harvard, Boston boasts more literary institutions than any other town in America, whether in its remarkably fine public library, its Athenaeum, which corresponds to our royal institution, its two museums, or the English High and Latin School, the first public school in the States. One of the celebrated steamers of the Fall River Line took us that evening to Newport. What fascination the word exercises over the aristocracy of America. Filled throughout the summer months with society, select and fashionable, hospitable to foreigners, but difficult of access to newcomers, and closed to those who do not belong to the upper circle of finance. The gay butterfly life is carried on in cottages, or villas, as we should call them, small houses, unattractive outside, standing in gardens adjoining the road, too public and suburban for English taste. So also is the life entirely without privacy. Morning calls are customary, and beginning society thus early does not prevent its being carried on at high pressure for the remainder of the day. There is a well-known and accommodating Frenchman who undertakes not only to supply a cottage, but all the elaborate necessaries, servants, linen, plate, etc., for a stay at Newport. The Ocean Drive and Bellevue Avenue are daily crowded with joyous equipages 
and neat phaetons driven by their fair owners and equestrians the toilets are very elaborate and of unceasing variety the cost must be enormous seeing that prices are double if not treble those of london and paris the profusion of lace and jewels is unending but a feeling is gaining ground that elaborate costumes and diamonds are a little out of place in the morning a colored maid observed to her mistress in response to a rebuke that she had been accustomed to live with people of quality pressed as to what she understood by people of quality she promptly replied they were those who dressed simply and wore no jewels by day we had wretched weather a sea fog which penetrated everything and succeeded in damping even the bright life of newport polo and yachting are very favorite amusements here a dance was given at the casino in the evening in honor of the yachts which managed to come round in the course of the day from new brighton despite the thick fog and to which we went these casino dances take place two nights in the week the entry is only by payment no vouchers are required and yet i believe they are as the newportians say quite select this fact may be cited as a proof that no one not in the set attempts life at newport the latter place and its inhabitants look down with ineffable scorn and covert sneer at the rival watering place of saratoga a tempest of wind and rain added to the discomforts of the ocean house let no one be deceived by advertisements and a printed list of guests in daily papers into thinking it a palatial abode caused us to abandon all idea of staying and leaving numerous letters of introduction unpresented we packed up and made the best of our way back to new york by a morning train end of chapter four part one chapter four part two of forty thousand miles over land and water this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org read by betty b forty thousand miles over land and water by ethel gwendolen vincent the american lakes and the centers of learning fashion and government part two august eighth after a day spent in new york we left for philadelphia crossing in the ferry to new jersey city where we saw the blackened ruins of the pennsylvania station burnt a few days previously three hours quick run brought us to philadelphia and the hotel lafayette independence hall is the center of interest in philadelphia a low stucco building supported by pillars it is fraught with precious recollections of the great struggle for freedom it was here that the declaration of independence was signed on the fourth of july seventeen seventy six and publicly announced from the center steps in the same chamber george washington was appointed commander of the army and delivered a farewell address and here congress afterwards held its sittings till seventeen ninety seven in a room facing the hall are some relics amongst a medley of autographs and medals we singled out a cast of washington's face taken after death his horn spectacles and compass we saw an earthenware pitcher brought over by one of the pilgrims of the mayflower and the old liberty bell that sounded to the people the first note of freedom in the adoption of the declaration of independence proclaim liberty throughout the land unto all the inhabitants thereof is the appropriate motto graven on its mouldy green side the city hall yet unfinished is of magnificent proportions square built its four sides face and form the very centre of the town the point to which all the principal avenues converge the blocks of marble used in the construction are enormous and the four gateways are supported by colossal marble figures close by is the masonic temple with the tower of quaint turrets and a beautiful norman archway and opposite a church built of a curious green stone called serpentine many years ago a frenchman called stephen gerard came and settled in philadelphia he conceived the idea of bequeathing his property to the state at his death it was valued at several millions and a bequest was especially left of two million dollars 
to erect a college for orphan children his wish was carried out in the building of this magnificent corinthian marble edifice called gerard college it contains large lecture and classrooms the dormitories and professors houses being in two adjoining wings there is no question of election any orphan boy from pennsylvania or new york state is eligible and the number now eleven hundred is yearly increasing owing to the rise in value of the gerard property one curious restriction alone there is in accordance with a provision in the will no religious teaching of any sort is allowed only the elements of morality are taught and no clergyman of any sect is given entrance to the college a marble statue of the founder representing him as a little benevolent wrinkled frenchman faces the entrance beneath which monument he lies buried the pennsylvania hospital though otherwise uninteresting has such a very quaint inscription on the cornerstone that i think it is quite worth giving in the year of christ seventeen fifty five george the second happily reigning for he sought the happiness of his people philadelphia flourishing for its inhabitants were public spirited this building by the bounty of the government and many private persons was piously founded for relief of the sick and miserable may the god of mercies bless the undertaking we had a pretty drive through fairmount park and ascended by the elevator how great the americans always are at any of these mechanical contrivances for saving labor to a platform two hundred fifty feet high where we had a beautiful view of the three thousand wooded undulating acres that form one of the largest parks in the world to give an idea of its comparative size windsor has only eighteen hundred acres the bois de boulogne twenty one fifty eight the prater twenty five hundred and richmond twenty four sixty eight it is five miles long and six broad we had not time to go and see the memorial hall museum in the park built in commemoration of the centennial exhibition of eighteen seventy six and which contains the nucleus of an art industrial collection after the model of south kensington a drive through chestnut street with a hurried glance at the fine stores and we reached the station in time for the afternoon train to washington the towns of america with their even square blocks so regularly and precisely intersected at right angles leading to the capitol city hall or state house whichever is the presiding genius are apt to become wearisome in the extreme how delightfully then we compared washington to these the beautiful city of distances it were worth coming some way if only to see the magnificent breadth of pennsylvania avenue at washington paved with asphalt and lighted by electricity sweeping in a perfectly straight line of one mile from the dome of the capitol to the corinthian pillars of the treasury the other avenues and streets are numerically as well as alphabetically named commencing from the capital fifteen of the principal avenues take the names of the fifteen states which comprised the union in seventeen ninety nine when government first ordered buildings to be erected for the president congress and public offices and removed the seat of government to washington the next morning was sunday and we went to service at st john's the fashionable church in the precincts of lafayette square where the president attends but a remarkably small dark edifice we strolled back to riggs house through the square here stands the equestrian statue to general jackson which is cast from the brass guns and mortars he captured the poise of the figure is very fine as he sits the horse which is represented as rearing the balance of this position is only maintained by the flanks and tail of the horse being filled with solid metal the small red brick houses in the square overshadowed by the neighboring trees where most of the senators and members live remind one of many a story of wire pulling and place hunting exercised by the clever wives of influential senators it is a center of intrigue during the session for the influence of women plays no unimportant part in american politics the white house is quite near it is a low stucco building standing in a garden a small strip only of which is kept private 
the remainder lying open to the public from the entrance gate where there are neither military nor police on duty a broad gravel drive sweeps under the portico inside there is a long corridor hung with portraits of former presidents a screen of colored glass divides this corridor from another which leads off to the principal sitting rooms it would be difficult to imagine any official residence so simply appointed as the white house the state dining room which they say will hold thirty-five on occasion but it must be a tight fit is most suitable for everyday use a room with terracotta walls is an ordinary drawing room the blue room is circular and here the president stands and receives at the levees which are open to all comers the green room is a large drawing room and a ballroom in white and gold with enormous pendant chandeliers forms the entire suite a back staircase at either end leads to the upper floor the state department and the war and navy have very fine buildings beyond the white house an obliging official a groom of the chambers who descends in his office to successive presidents showed us through but as for seeing anything of the other public buildings in washington on sunday we found it was utterly impossible the further south you come the more abundant are the black woolly heads of the negroes with the flaming colors they love to wear the orange plume with the purple green or alternating with stripes of red and yellow the further south you come also the stricter is the observance of the sabbath we took the car and explored the dreary suburb of georgetown as we approached a cross street the boom of muffled drums and the strains of a funeral march were heard and we stopped to allow of a long procession headed by various deputations to pass the open hearse drawn by white horses was followed by some mourning coaches it was the funeral of one of the unfortunate victims of greeley's arctic expedition the press just now are celebrating the honors of his return and side by side is raised a controversy on the awful doubt as to whether cannibalism was resorted to or not certain it is that when the bodies were disinterred by the rescue party to be brought home the flesh was found stripped off the bodies in many cases some said it was used as a bait for fishing but the more dreadful suspicion is that the survivors pushed to the last extremity devoured it in the case of private henry shot for stealing the stores really is even accused by the relations of resorting to that punishment in order to provide sustenance it is hard very hard that after the intolerable dangers and hardships the brave little band endured such suspicions should be raised to meet them on arrival at home strolling about the avenue rather aimlessly we came to an equestrian statue on inquiring about the original a passer-by advised us if we wanted to see statues to go further on to the circle from here we occupied a central position looking down no less than eight broad avenues and seeing in them some six or all the principal statues of the city in a coup d'oeil an ugly circular temple with an obelisk of granite 550 feet high is being erected as a grand national monument to washington it stands facing the semicircular portico of the back of the white house between that and the river potomac monday eleventh of august washington we had to be up very early to see the capitol before leaving by a ten o'clock train what a beautiful building it is standing as it does on the capitol hill with its broad stone terraces and grass slopes leading into a park the west front with a flight of innumerable steps the length of the center building commands the plaza and the newly elected president standing there delivers his inaugural address to the people below the first building laid by washington was burnt in seventeen ninety three and the present one was commenced twenty eight years after daniel webster laid the cornerstone and inscribed on it an inscription grandly worthy of the building that rose above it if therefore it shall be hereafter the will of god that this structure shall fall from its base that its foundation be upturned and this deposit brought to the eyes of men be it then known that on this day the union of the united states of america stands firm 
that their constitution still exists unimpaired and with all its original usefulness and glory growing every day stronger and stronger in the affection of the great body of the american people and attracting more and more the admiration of the world and all here assembled whether belonging to public life or to private life with hearts devoutly thankful to almighty god for the preservation of the liberty and happiness of the country unite in sincere and fervent prayers that this deposit and the walls and arches the domes and towers the columns and entablatures now to be erected over it may endure for ever god save the united states of america the colossal bronze statue of liberty crowns the iron dome and under the corinthian portico are the bronze doors almost as fine in workmanship as those of the baptistry at florence they represent columbus's interview with ferdinand and isabella his landing in america his battle with the indians triumphant return imprisonment and death the rotunda is decorated with frescoes painted in such a way as to appear in bas relief under the dome is shown the stone where garfield's body lay in state for three days visited by thousands of people it was estimated that each incoming train brought its hundreds into washington during those few days the americans were most deeply touched and allude even now to the wreath sent by the queen the two wings are given up the one to the senate and the other to the house of representatives the old senate chamber is now used as the supreme court of justice the highest judicial tribunal in america the various lobbies and reception rooms are very gorgeous in different colored marbles and ceilings frescoed and gilded but the interior is hardly worthy of the plain but massive grandeur of the exterior the gallery in the house of representatives will seat twelve hundred and it is not reserved only for reporters or friends of members but open to the public and to any who care to hear the debates there is a ventilator underneath each member's seat which enables him to regulate the hot air at will we were much amused at the ragged condition of the speaker's table the blue cloth being hammered to pieces in the interests of order a national statue gallery has been formed by the excellent idea of inviting each state to send statues of two of its most representative men i admired particularly among the frescoes one by lutz called westward ho very touching in its speaking significance of the hardship the first emigrants endured it represents the cart piled up with household goods the mother pale and dejected with the baby sitting on the top the elder children plodding along unheeding whilst the father points hopefully toward the west in the background other emigrants are crowding along the track the sergeant at arms room is small too small they say for payday when the members come to receive their salaries fancy paying your member one thousand pounds a year to represent your interests he must be dearly bought in many cases the total comes to double our civil list the president's salary is only ten thousand pounds too meagre for the representative of such a great nation and the ministers and judges only receive the insufficient salary of fifteen hundred pounds per annum frequent scandals are the result of this parsimony such a beautiful view is obtained of the broad avenues and public buildings of the city from the windows of the west front and the silver band of the potomac winding round the outskirts at the foot of the green heights of mount vernon we should like to have found time to go to mount vernon and have seen the plain wooden house in a lovely situation overhanging the river which washington made his home also the key of the bastille given to him by lafayette and the room where he died the plain marble sarcophagi near the landing stage marks the tombs of washington and martha his wife the house after his death was bought and presented to the nation by the women of america we had to give up all idea of seeing the smithsonian institute a gothic building of red sandstone standing in its own park presented to the city by mr smithson an englishman and the patent office we found was not open at this early hour of the morning inventive genius is here protected and encouraged in tin boxes labeled and kept in pigeonholes is a model of every patent that has ever been taken out the fees are much smaller than in england and contrivances for the most homely details 
have thus been protected. End of section 5